Psalm 137, 9, why is it okay to say, quote, blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock, unquote. This is directed mm-hmm. at the children of Babylon. Crushing the skulls of babies sounds like an atrocity, not judgment. It isn't merely descriptive, but rather a blessing upon the murder of babies. Yeah, this imprecation, I mean, it's it's very easy, you know, for us to, to look at that and sort of view view this as an isolated event, you know, with with sort of no context. But the logic of it, I mean, it, it's it's poetic language, which doesn't mean that that the psalmist isn't really wishing it uh, because the psalmist is wishing for you know his enemies to be judged. You know, whether that means every last person or not is, you know, is, is a different issue, different but related issue. But let's just, you know, take the language for what it is. My view of imprecation, and I'll be honest, I, we, we, I think we've had this this question maybe a long, long time ago, or we did it somewhere. I can't remember what it was, maybe in the series in Leviticus. But my view, I, I'll be honest, is a minority position. And it's not an insignificant one, though, but it, it is going to be a minority position. So in a nutshell, I look at imprecatory prayer as deriving from the Abrahamic covenant, okay, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And in that passage, God himself tells Abraham that he will curse anyone who curses him, you know, treats him lightly and his descendants, you know, in other words, God's children. Uh, so if, if, if someone, you know, treats them with contempt, God says, I'm, I'm going to judge them. So when the psalmist or anyone else prays for God to judge people, even even killing them, even killing their relatives or their children. The basis of wanting that to happen, there's a context to it, and specifically in Psalm, you know, one thirty nine. I mean, you, you, the, the questioner brought up Babylon. Babylon had a long, long, long history of again being the bad guy in the Old Testament, specifically, you know, toward the people of God, toward Israel. So the psalmist is, in effect, asking God to remember Genesis 12, 1 through 3. The psalmist is not going to take the matter into his own hands. What imprecatory prayers and imprecatory psalms really mean is that the person is angry or in anguish and saying, God, I want you to remember that you said those who who do X, Y, Z to us, those who treat us with contempt, you will judge, you will curse them. I am asking you to do that. I'm asking you to remember this covenantal promise and take care of business. You know, even to the nth degree, even to these, these, you know, horrific, you know, sort of over the top kind of descriptions. But the psalmist is not going to act on that emotion. The psalmist is asking God to take care of the problem, to judge the evildoer in whatever way God sees fit. And and I think that all this, that, that's important because at the heart of it, the, the, it, it's not a biblical justification for you to get angry at someone and lash out at them. It's actually the opposite. It's It's a biblical injunction for you to tell God just how you feel, e- even in, in really, you know, dark terms. You know, you're you're telling God just how you feel. In the case of the Israelites, I mean, they had they'd seen all this happen to them, you know, a hundred times over. You know, we're going through the Book of Ezekiel. This is the kind of stuff you get. That especially in an episode, it might have been the last episode with the Assyrians. I mean, it, it gets even worse than that. And and this is what they had experienced. And so for the psalmist to say, "What gives?" God, you need, you know, now to turn around. I mean, you could say, well, I get it. You know, we apostatize. We went and worship other gods. This is what happens. But that doesn't take away the Abrahamic covenant. The psalmist wants justice, you know, in, in the end, on the basis of this covenant. And so that's what imprecation is really about. Now, Christians, you know, the, the question comes up, what about Christians? You know, you know, should we pray these kind of prayers? You know, should we vent this way? Uh, like, like, the people in the Old Testament did. I would I would say yes, because Christians are the inheritors of the Abrahamic covenant. That is explicitly stated in Galatians 3. So it stands to reason we can ask God to judge our enemies as well. What we can't do is judge our enemies ourselves. We're not supposed to take matters into our own hands. So the, these prayers at, at their very heart are, are pleased to God in, in very visceral language. For God to judge evil, God to judge the, the people 
who are doing bad things to his his kids, his children, for God to remember the original promise, Genesis 12, 1 to 3, and do something about it. And then you just leave it up to God. Imprecation is not a justification for a Christian or anyone, whether it was an Old Testament Israelite either, for taking matters into their own hands. And, and they're, you know, that that's just, I think, how we need to frame uh, the discussion. It's up to God how he will remove and judge those who oppress and curse his children. That's up to God. It might be something mild God decides to do, or it may, you know, be something harsh, but it, that's up to God. That's his job description, and it's not ours. And I would suggest, I really don't think that there are you know, really any coherent alternatives uh, to take the language seriously, but yet realize that the psalmist isn't asking God permission, you know, to, to do these things themselves. He, they're just using the, the most, you know, again, visceral language that you can use. But they're leaving it up to God ultimately. And if God judges the, the Babylonians a different way, uh, you know, then that's up to God. And, and, and the person praying the prayer has to be content with the way God took care of the situation. And it may not be what they want or what they're feeling, uh, but God lets people emote. God lets people tell, tell him exactly how they feel. But the, the, the key here is you, you let God decide. You let God decide what, you know, what, what's best. I think, you know, lastly, you know, we also kind of get a little offended, you know, by the whole, by, by the language. We need to remember that the divine warrior imagery from the Old Testament, and that's not just Old Testament. We've talked about this before in the podcast where the description of God as a warrior on the, on the behalf of his children, you know, Israel specifically. That stuff, like in Psalm 68, you know, just plucking out an example, there's, there are a number of divine warrior passages. That language in the Old Testament does, in fact, get applied to Jesus in the New Testament. And that's, the reason for that is, is the, the vision of the Messiah coming back at the day of the Lord to judge the nations, you know, to, to judge Israel's enemies. And if you look at day of the Lord passages, yeah, it, it People are going to lose their lives. It's going to be violent. You know, it's going to be bad. But th that isn't the only way that God judges. But that's part of the picture. So, uh, you know, at the return of the Lord, you know, at the at the day of the Lord, the return of Christ, He is not coming back blowing kisses. All right, He is cast as the judge of the nations, and that's His job to decide how evil gets judged. But He allows us. He allows the psalmist, and I, again, I would say us as well, to vent. Uh, he knows who we are. He knows we're human. He allows us to vent, but the venting is supposed to leave the matter with him and not take things into our own hands.